What's up, Freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I had the immense pleasure of sitting down with the co-founders of, Alexan of Alexander Leishman. I guess his parents would be the co-founders of him. Uh, but Alex is a co-founder of River Financial, along with Andrew Benson. We sat down to discuss uh, the news today that they're going to be able to operate in Hawaii. And it wasn't just us three. Matt Dell joined us as well. We had a, a far-ranging, interesting conversation, everything from uh, the journey River's been on to the, the uh, regulatory red tape they've had to get through to the specifics of the regulatory environment in Hawaii, uh, Bitcoin. You, you guys will listen to it. You're going to listen to it. You're going to hear it. What am I, what am I telling you what's going to happen before you're about to listen to it? It's not what you're here for. I'm sorry I'm doing this to you. It's just like a, a mental tick when I do these intros. I just mentally think about what we talked about and and try to give you like a little hint what's going. But you'll hear it. You'll hear it. You'll hear it anyway. Okay. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. And as you can hear, I just got a Slack notification. But let me tell you about the Cash App before I get to this Slack message. All right. The Slack Slack message can wait. The Cash App needs to be described to you freaks right now. The Cash App is the easiest place to stack sats in the U.S. You can stack sats, send sats, receive sats, sell sats if you so please. Uh, and you can also DCA in the sats. You can set it and forget it. You can buy daily, uh, weekly, bi-weekly via the Cash App. On top of that, they're making sats the standard. We're no longer buying fractions of Bitcoin. We're buying whole sats. Keep that in mind. We're buying whole sats. You're stacking sats. You're stacking whole sats. I haven't heard of anybody stacking a fraction of a sat on the cash app yet. If you see anybody out there doing that, let me know. Uh, another thing, today a bunch of people have been adding me on Twitter showing uh showing me their their boost cards, the new the new someone's blow me up on Slack. The new glow in the dark uh boost cards so you can use anywhere Visa's accepted. You, know, you connect your bank account to Cash App, you can even make the Cash App your bank account. They're giving out account number and routing numbers so you can direct to deposit your paychecks uh, and use it as a bank account and they have these cool little debit cards you can personalize put a bitcoin logo uh saw a really cool one today going back to sats uh, one bitcoin equals 100 million sats never forget that on top of this uh they have their cash app investing if you guys want to stack slivers of stonks you can do that if you're into the stonk market cash app is letting you buy as little as one dollar worth of your favorite stonk uh cash app investing is a subsidiary at square remember sipc and as always, oh, look who's look who's flying in for this. What's up, dude? What's up? I haven't seen you since last week's RHR. We got our friend Al here. Uh, he is an Al. I don't know his name. He hasn't he hasn't said it to me yet. Uh, but when you download the app, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's one word: S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're gonna get ten dollars, and ten dollars is gonna go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. Good friend of my buddy here on the perch, Owls Lacrosse. Woo! Woo! Join me, join me. <laughs> Download the Cash App and enjoy this episode with Andrew and Alex. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts. All, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. You probably should be. You probably should be. Boom. Tales from the Crypt. It's Marty Bent here. New intro. Uh, we threw this episode together really quickly, so thinking on the fly here, uh, sitting down, we've got Matt O'Dell here, yo, yo, and yo. we are joined by the co-founders, cousin co-founders, just found that out minutes ago, of uh, River Financial. Uh, Alex Leishman has been on the podcast before, and Andrew Benson, who's a newbie. Welcome, guys. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having us. It's good to be back. Well, it's good to have you back, uh, especially considering the... Uh, the impetus for this episode, which is the big news from River Financial about your your foray into Hawaii. Uh, very excited to talk about that, get an update on what's been going on, what you guys have seen as an exchange throughout this year, particularly. Um, but first, 
we had to hear Andrew's story. I, I didn't realize you guys were cousin co-founders, number one. Andrew, how the hell did you get working with your cousin to build a Bitcoin exchange? So Alex got me into Bitcoin back in 2013. And uh, since then, I've been following it, not professionally, but my interest has always been at the intersection of you know, finance and technology. Bitcoin is kind of the natural extension of that, especially um, because I'm a bit of a libertarian as well. Uh, so it was just a natural fit. And then when I moved out to the Bay Area about two years ago, um, linked up with Alex out here, uh, and we, we started talking about something, you know, we might build in this space. Um, and, and that's kind of how it got started. Uh, but we've been both entrepreneurial in our own ways um, for, for years. And uh, Alex brings the, the technical expertise um, and the hardcore Bitcoiner to the table. Um, and, I, and I kind of help on the, the operational side and, and regulatory side. The boring side? The boring side, if you will, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, uh... I'd, say, I'd say this company, uh, you know, we're like the yin and the yang. You know, it would, it would fall apart without either of us. You know, Andrew brings the, the, the operational expertise and the rock solid, um, you know, attention to detail. And I bring the, like, the Bitcoin mentality the kind of sometimes the pie in the sky visions that you know Andrew has to rein in, um, and so it's you know it's a we're a really good combo. Yeah, well, Andrew, I'd like to dive into what your job entails because you guys have slowly had to piecemeal state by state uh, your availability to users, and so what's that process been like? And that could easily segue into the process uh, with Hawaii, which has been a. a a state that's very hard to, to get a Bitcoin focused business uh, domiciled in. Absolutely. So at River, I wear a lot of different hats, but really the, the big task that I've had since we started this company is expanding our availability um, to get into all 50 states. Um, right now we're at 30. We just announced Hawaii today, which is our 30th state. Um, and, and when really looking at regulatory strategy, it touches on a bunch of different aspects of the business. So it's quite ingrained to um, you know, our banking relationships, it's ingrained into our um, information security and information technology programs and policies. Um, it's ingrained to AML, uh, privacy, a uh, bunch of other bunch of other things that you might might expect some which you may not expect. Um, so, you know, this has been a it's been a long time coming to get access to 30 states. And, you know, we still have a good bit left. I think we'll be in 40 by the end of the year. Um, and when we launched early last year, we launched with eight states. Uh, and, and, you know, we've been going the money transmitter licensing route um, and, you know, working with regulators has actually been quite an interesting experience. Um, and I've learned a lot from, from, from different folks in this space, as well as the regulators. It's been a very valuable experience. What, uh, what have the banking relationships been like? Is something like Avanti uh, a big deal for you guys particularly? Um, I think what Avanti is doing is interesting. I think what Caitlin's building out in Wyoming um, is great for the space. I do think the regulatory landscape is evolving quite quickly. And uh, I'm sure you've seen the OCC announcement that OCC chartered banks can now custody cryptocurrency. Um, and so I think that's really going to accelerate adoption. But I, in some ways, I think Wyoming kind of built the framework for it um, and the proof of concept of that special purpose depository institution. On our end specifically, there's just not many banks that will work with cryptocurrency companies, especially ones that are consumer facing, um, like River Financial. So there's probably four or five banks in the country that will work with us. Uh, and, and, you know, we need that for ACH processing, wire processing, um, moving money between exchanges um, in our, our custody as well. So most of that's on the US dollar side. Um, and, and even that has a lot of complica complications. But we, you know, they, the banks have a, even a higher standard than regulators often. Um, so securing those partnerships is, is not a low lift by any means. No, I mean, it has uh, been impressive, though, how, how quickly you guys have expanded to 30 states. I believe, Alex, when we talked last year, it was below 10. Yeah, I think it was eight. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've come a long way. And I think, you know, we'll be in most, most, almost all states pretty soon. New York is the final boss. <laughs> ah, the final boss. Just leave New York for dead. <laughs> well, I yeah i was listening to uh the recent episode with noted i forget the gentleman's name it was on justin something i believe he's a lawyer he's talking about like new york you can sort of get grandfathered into a bit license by uh with by another company that already has one 
Uh, it's for like the back back road that people are taking to get it. There's a there's a sandbox program that they're exploring. I don't think it's officially opened up yet. Last time I looked, but um, and the details are a bit sparse right now. But they're looking into something to make it easier for companies to get access to New York um, by working with the company that already has a bit license, um, which which is interesting. But it has its limitations as well. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't. You know, there's there's complications as well. Like one of the things we've had to spend a lot of time thinking about, just in general, from the beginning, has been how do we align the technical strategy with the regulatory strategy? Because they have to go hand in hand. Um, and uh, kind of relying on uh, another partner would have been difficult um, to to do if we wanted to build out our own Bitcoin technology from from scratch and really build it from the ground up. Let's dive into that partnering your your technical strategy with your regulatory strategy is that in terms of custody and how quickly you can get bitcoin to customers or yeah so i mean i I can speak a little to that so um you know part of our goal here is to build a vertically integrated bitcoin financial institution that's that's what we've done and we want to continue um to you build build what we think is is the future of, of bitcoin financial institutions and in order to do that, we had to build it all ourselves. But um, like Andrew said, you know, that required a lot of regulatory work. The fast way to get to market is to rely on a third party custodian, uh, you know, like a BitGo or a Prime Trust or someone, something, and just build an app on top of that. Um, but if you rely on that and you rely on kind of the licenses of that custodian to, to go to market, there's a lot that you can't do. For example, um, we can offer Lightning Network support, right? We're always, we would always move as slow as these custodians move. And as we know, none of these custodians are Bitcoin only, right? So they're all bogged down by this engineering debt of supporting, you know, thousands of different cryptocurrencies. So none of them are actually like pushing the cutting edge forward on the Bitcoin side of things, right? So, you know, uh, if, you know, if Taproot comes out, right, these custodians are probably going to be a year or two behind supporting that. Way longer if, than uh, that. Yeah. Way longer than that, right? Um, you know, even just like native multi-sig, uh, a rap, a, a native segwit, you know, multi-sig stuff, um, things like that, you know, these custodians are, there's always a big lag because their focus just is not on pushing Bitcoin forward. And so, you know, we would not be able to build the quality of institution that we wanted to build, um, you know, if we relied on third parties. So that, that was our thinking. Um, and... Yeah, so I mean, it's it's really as simple as that, right? You kind of have to do everything yourself if you want to do it right, uh, from a technical perspective. The hard way, but probably uh, the most worthwhile way at the end of the day when all is said and done. Absolutely, and it's it's that constant trade off you have of you know getting to market the fastest way versus positioning yourself best for the long run, um, and, and you know just in general, we take a long term approach to things. So. Just because we, you know, looked at things and said, okay, based on what we want to build, we can only launch eight states. That really didn't discourage us. We just decided, you know, we'll put in an effort ourselves, get all the licenses that we need to get, and uh, just, you know, build slowly because, you know, we're working toward building the right thing, which has been missing in this space. Yeah, your your lightning demos, the lightning implementation is very sleek. Thanks. Yeah, we have a lot of cool stuff we're working on uh, behind the scenes, beta testing. We got some. Uh, Cool. So, uh, some, so you know, because we built out our own Bitcoin stuff, we actually have our this, this wallet service on the back end, um, and this is a uh, you know kind of what we think is kind of like the best en- enterprise Bitcoin wallet out there in the sense that you know we, it talks to Bitcoin Core to get all the blockchain data, but then after that, you know, we have uh, this flexible code base that allows us to do all sorts of stuff with Bitcoin wallets. So. Um, you know, V version one was, you know, our Bitcoin wallets are holding, you know, funds for our customers, right? But, we, you know, uh, Phil, our lead Bitcoin engineer, uh, and I were sitting around, uh, I think we were eating ice cream one day or something, and, we, and, and Phil goes, you know, why does our Bitcoin wallet only need to watch the Bitcoins that we hold, right? Why can't it watch Bitcoins we don't custody? And so we realized, you know, with the flexible code base we wrote, we could build this um, we could build basically watch-only wallets for our clients and allow them to register their hardware wallets, register their, the wallets they control, and see all those coins in River uh, and, and when they log into River. And then on top of that, um, we could let them buy on River, transfer those coins to their own custody, but keep all the tax information, all the accounting stuff that they need. And then um, going from there, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, all sorts of stuff we could do. So we're kind of now, you know, because of all this cool info we built, we can be this 
you know, reporting layer on top of coins they, they trust us to custody and coins they custody themselves. And we have a lot of cool things we're uh, thinking um, thinking about launching there. That's it's harder pretty, wallet product than beta. That's pretty huge because the the base level assumptions when you move coins off an exchange that is that you're spending them or correct from regulators' perspective since so they know that you have a wallet connected and. Well, I mean, it, it, the IRS is, you know, it's, it's on you to report what the IRS deems as a realized event that, you know, if, if, if it's, if you're tra transferring it to your own custody and Andrew can correct me, you know, if there's anything I get wrong here, but it's not technically a taxable event. Um, but the, pro one of the challenges is like you lose all the information associated with those coins when you transfer them out. Right. Um, uh, to your own custody. If you're spending those coins, that is a taxable event, well, right? Um, I think what, but if you're to... what Marty's referring to is on Coinbase, if you export your tax documents, Coinbase puts it on their tax document that they export to you oh, as a sell. That's what it is. Which is just that's confusing. It conf it's confusing to everyone. And I think the reason they do that is because when you're sending Bitcoin, the exchange doesn't know and they can't prove that you know this is going to buy something or if you're just going to withdraw to self-custody and they have to report this they have to report something on the 1099k forms um and they can only report what they know which is that this bitcoin is no longer uh being held in that person's name at that same financial institution mm -hmm. so that uh that, that is one of the ui challenges and a lot of people um i think would be confused on you know adding something to a withdraw flow whether you're sending it to yourself or you're using it to buy um and that has tax implications down the line. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, like you mentioned earlier, uh, you built you built slow. You wanted to have a strong foundation, uh, and with the negative being that you weren't first to market necessarily. But the end result seems to be that going forward, you're going to be first to market on a lot of things. Like I, I I'm really this this whole lightning integration you have is way ahead of the curve of everyone except for for maybe jack maulers and strike who's who just came out of the gate uh i mean i i don't think i don't think there's another u.s exchange that offers any kind of lightning and the the non-custodial idea would be huge to me like i think as a as a user well not a river user yet unfortunately because it isn't in new york um <laughs> the idea that you could auto stack and go straight to a new address every time I think would be uh, an absolute game changer from a user perspective. Totally. I mean, and on top of that, um, you know, we're going to be rolling out a mobile app too. And, you know, one of the, the things that kind of, that kind of stinks, like if you have your Bitcoin and cold storage is you don't really have easy visibility to it, into it, you know, when the price changes. Um, and, you know, if you've registered your cold wallet with River, right, you can still see all those coins in one place. You can still see the value. You can still see your, your full stack, right? You know, a lot of people, they, they, they always forget exactly how many Bitcoin they have, and they'll occasionally go back to, like, check and add up in a spreadsheet, you know, in all their different wallets. And this just makes it a little easier to kind of just open your app and see, like, oh, wow, like, yeah, that's right. That's right. I have that many, you know? Um, so I think that'll also be pretty cool to people. And it's really the first step of bridging the UX gap between custodial solutions and non-custodial solutions um, and kind of giving people access to, to non-custodial functionality at their fingertips, um, which, you know, is something that's largely missing right now. Yeah. Again, yeah. I mean, these functionalities are proving that going, going, taking the long road is, is, is working out. And yeah. so, and so, I mean, let's get to the topic of, today's episode which is your your work in hawaii get into hawaii i think we should go over the history of bitcoin in hawaii uh 2016 was a pivotal year uh they made some weird regulations and you guys have been working closely with with a regulatory institution that sounds too much like DeFi um in the dfi to to make it so hawaiians are able to purchase bitcoin via river what's that journey been like what were the conversations like and um, how, how did this sand, uh, you mentioned a sandbox in New York earlier. It's the, technically this, um, this situation with, with Hawaii is also sandbox. Yes. It's a little bit of a different sandbox. And so I guess going back, let's, you know, rewind the clock here and go back to 2016 and talk about what happened then. Um, cause I think what is going on today is, 
you know, is, is really relevant to kind of unpack what happened then. So back in 2016, the, the state legislature had changed the law, essentially st stating that the if you if you were holding assets, digital assets or Bitcoin, on behalf of a Hawaii consumer, you have to have that fully collateralized with dollars. And if you think about that for a second, right? Let's say somebody buys one Bitcoin. Yesterday it was twelve thousand. Uh, today it's you know eleven thousand seven hundred. Tomorrow it could be twenty thousand. Who knows? Throughout that whole time, the, the the custodian would have to keep one dollar in reserve in fiat for that that Bitcoin. And you know when the when the price fluctuates, so does their mandate as well. Um, and if you just think about the economics, you know, on an exchange who charges maybe a half a percent, one percent, two percent, whatever, it, it's very 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 capital inefficient um, to hold Bitcoin for consumers. So. Basically, everybody pulled out of the state of Hawaii. Um, I do know that there have been some companies that have decided to say, screw it, we're going to keep op operating legally. But all of the, the main legitimate ones have, have largely pulled out. Um, and so it's been kind of a black hole in the space since then. Um, and so fast forwarding, uh, you know, a little bit after that, the, the banking commissioner uh, for Hawaii, she, she didn't really like this mandate that the uh, legislator put down. Um, so she, she had proposed multiple changes. I think every year for the last three years, she's proposed a new piece of legislation that would effectively change that mandate to kind of bring it in line with the other 49 states. Um, and they've rejected it all three times. So she used her regulatory power um, and executive, executive power essentially to create a regulatory sandbox where she would supervise a handful of companies um, that, that have good reputations and that you know, intend to be fully compliant with Hawaiian laws, basically issuing a no action letter um, so that a license would not be required in the state. And therefore, this specific mandate would not be uh, applicable. Um, and, and so she, she did that. And uh, this, is, this is one of those cases where I think, you know, a regulator has stood up to do the right thing to kind of, uh, you know, make it easier to do business in the state. And, uh, you know, I think she should be applauded for that. Um, and so, you know, We've applied to the program, um, and today we we go live in Hawaii, which we're very excited about. Smart regulation. Never thought I'd see the day. Um, that that 2016 law doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't the the purchaser of the Bitcoin assume the price risk too, like the, the price volatility? It just seems one would think, but as you as you know that you know regulators and legislators have varying degrees of understanding of this this space, um, and. Uh, I, I don't know if it was purposefully misunderstanding it or they just really didn't understand it. I don't know, but um, it, 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 it's a very impractical law that they put on the books. It was yeah. it was basically a ban. In effect, it was a ban. Yeah, because no one's going to do that. Action. If the price runs up, you just get completely fucked as a business. No one would ever do that. Yeah. No. I think the Federal Reserve would probably be the only institution <laughs> that, that could potentially <laughs> comply with that law. Well. Um, was was Cash App complying with it? Because they're they've been able to sell Bitcoin, right? In Hawaii, I think, it, I think in late 2018 they switched. They might be, they might have, like live under some other regulatory regime because of their bank charter. I don't mm -hmm. know, uh, Andrew. You might. Know so, some institutions like banks can basically say that specific state laws are not applicable to them, but that's uh, that some some can do that, some can't. It's it's kind of tricky. Yeah. Yeah. It's so messy. So the sandbox uh, is around for three years, correct? Uh, two years. Two years. So it, it, it ends, I believe, at the end of 2022. So a little bit over two years. And so what is the state legislator and the regulators, what are, what are they looking for within these two years? What, uh, what do you guys have to prove to them before the end of 2022? Yeah, great question. So we have quarterly reporting requirements. Um, and, and basically, this is just for them to keep a pulse on how the, the program is going, um, getting an understanding of the utilization of it by Hawaiian consumers, uh, seeing what kind of volume, what kind of revenue, what it, re what it really does for the state. So there's going to be a lot of financial reporting that we provide um, to the state. And it, none of it's about specific users um, or anything like that would violate a user's privacy. Uh, but, but it's mainly just kind of keeping a, an eye on, you know, how many people are using this in the state of Hawaii? And I think this is going to be helpful um, for the DFI 
to go back to the legislature with some hard data and show, you know, the, the people of Hawaii want this kind of capability to, to be able to buy Bitcoin or, or conduct these kind of activities. Um, and so I, th I think it's really just a data gathering uh, program so that they can make a case, a strong case to the legislature to put a permanent regulatory framework in place. Do you think the Hawaiians are going to show up? I think so. We already saw them started to show up today already. Yes. Before, really? Even before today, we've had people reaching out saying, hey, I'm in Hawaii, can I use River? You know, and we're like, you know, soon TM. And, uh, <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> finally, finally, yeah. Ah, well, congrats. This is huge. No, I mean, it's a shame that people of Hawaii have had very few, if any, options to, to purchase Bitcoin up to this point. Uh, yeah, Coinbase pulled out of Hawaii years ago. Um, you know, when this law went into place, I think they were there really early on before like any regulation had really set in. Um, and they just pulled out, you know, years ago when the, when Hawaii came down with this, with this law. So, um, yeah, fin finally, uh, markets are opening up again. Yeah. So state number 30, we were at eight last year. And so I got, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this question because obviously you guys would have growth as you're, as you're adding more states to the, uh, available customer base uh, but what have you guys been seeing obviously attention around Bitcoin has been growing this year price has been rising as well we have institutional investors talking about throwing money at it uh, what are you guys seeing in terms of purchases user data signups the whole the whole nine yards yes so you know we're, we're seeing growth across the board obviously part of it's because we're expanding geographically part of it's because the markets are uh, really increasing activity. Um, I mean, I, I, so some of the trends that I personally find interesting and, and Andrew can I'm sure add a lot of color to this is um, we're seeing a lot of individual, you know, big money come in. Um, so people, you know, signing up forever, wiring us, you know, large chunks of money and, you know, just, just buying a bunch of Bitcoin for the first time usually. And, you know, the whole institutional story um, and, and meme is, 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 is interesting because, you know, and the way I always break this down is Bitcoin is really about the individual. It's always an individual story. It's always a story about the individual first. Every, pretty much every institutional purchase of Bitcoin is the result of an individual in that institution buying Bitcoin for themselves first. So what, what, what we're going to see before we see these, it's like, like the MicroStrategy purchase of Bitcoin, right? That CEO had bought Bitcoin before he had his company buy Bitcoin. Right? right. And so really, you, you need these business leaders, these high net worth individuals to individually be coming in and buying Bitcoin for themselves and making that jump before we see any sort of like, you know, large corporate movement to acquire Bitcoin. And, and, and that's that's what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing these high net worth individuals coming in kind of be finally. And, and, and a lot of it's because of kind of we have finally given them um, a place where they feel comfortable with, where they can talk to somebody on the phone, right? They can call us up. They're like, I've been wanting to buy Bitcoin for years, but like I go to these websites and like, I can't even reach anybody. Like I'm not going to send them like, you know, $2 million. Right. Um, well, so I, I, I was going to say, that's like something I wanted to bring up is the, the focus on customer service. You guys send a personalized package with a handwritten letter. It's a, a very nice touch. I'm a big fan of handwritten letters and, uh, so what is the reception of that been? And then on top of that, what are like some of the most common questions you're getting from these types of, uh, Bitcoin purchases, purchasers? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people, they, they have heard about Bitcoin, they don't really understand it and they love when they can call us up and we can patiently walk them through, you know, what is Bitcoin? How do I get Bitcoin? Um, uh, and, 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 you know, we can, we answer a lot of the questions they have. Sometimes these conversations can be, you know, 20, 30 minutes, but we don't mind, right? Because we're, we're really at the end of the day, we're selling people on Bitcoin. Um, and, and a lot of that's education and, you know, listening to what questions people have. Um, it's, it's interesting the, the different things that people think Bitcoin is. Um, I think it's kind of starting to shed its reputation as like underground dark web money. Um, and actually something that, you know, is becoming more and more prominent and relevant in today's economic environment. I think a lot of clients have come in, they've told us they're scared what's going on with the Federal Reserve and, and all the, 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 the overreach that we're seeing in terms of um, like low interest rates and just printing more and more money, reckless government spending. 
And a lot of people think that Bitcoin's the only way to opt out, that in gold. Um, and you know, a lot of these folks already have decent allocations in gold and want to diversify to something that they also see has a, a big upside and high potential. Uh, I just wanted to unpack this for a second because I've seen Alex on uh, Twitter reply guying uh, blue checks about your white glove two hundred and fifty million dollar buy service. Is that is that just a meme, or are you having hundred million dollar buys go through your service? We we have million dollar multiple million dollar buys go through. Um, on hundred 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 million. We haven't had hundred million dollar. Yeah, not yet. Like we have, uh, we've had had some people ask the question. I'm pretty we've sure gotten inquiries, we we got inquiries about that and larger. Um, but uh, the 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 sizes we're seeing it keep increasing. So I think it's only going to be a matter of time. I it feels like we're making a new record. It yeah. it personally puts a smile on my face every time I see you replying to a comment with "We can accommodate a 250 million dollar purchase." <laughs> yeah. The, the is. truth is, we can accommodate more than that, but you know, just yeah. being conservative. Wow. Yeah, just be conservative. Two fifty. It's Start really, un, it's really yeah. un, unzipping your pants and put your schlong on the table there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I don't know if this puts you guys in like. I, 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 pro, I know it doesn't put you in an uncomfortable situation, but that's a lot of conversations going on right now, especially as micro strategies buying something like twenty one thousand. Bitcoin, uh, uh, GBTC is uh, a lot of buy pressure. Cash apps making a lot of uh, sales as well. Um, their grow their sales are growing, and like the question of uh, rehypothecation is coming up. And like so, like I just want to get your opinion on that. Like, do you do you guys think there are some exchanges out there that not that you have to name any directly that that are rehypothecated? Does, does this sort of growth and interest in popularity and purchases of Bitcoin match up to uh, the price that we're seeing today, especially considering the halving from a few months ago? Yeah, I mean, I don't personally know of any ex- exchanges. I'm sure there are some that are doing it. We, we hold all coins in full reserve, hands down, um, you know, hands down. Um, as to other exchanges, uh, you know, I don't really know if they're doing anything funny with the Bitcoin. I've heard some things. Um, I mean, obviously, they're the they're the companies that are lending out your Bitcoin, right? And, you know, they're telling you that they're doing that. Um, like BlockFi. You know, whether the like BlockFi, right? You know, I mean, they're telling you that they're or doing Celsius, it, yeah. right? Or Celsius, right? Um, you know, are there are there exchanges doing it without telling you? Um, I would be surprised if there were any in the U.S. that were regulated that were doing that. Um, you know, yeah. the, the regulatory environment, you're required to get financial audits every year, and that would be pretty difficult to cover something like that up if you're regulated in the U.S. Um, so I'd be, I'd be a bit surprised if that were happening from the legitimate ones, but I'm sure it's probably happening on some of the other ones that, that aren't really uh, you know, compliant, if you will. It'd be worth reading through all these exchanges, terms of service, to yeah. see if there were clauses that allowed them to do that. That would that'd be where I look first. I yeah. I tend to agree, but you know, there's a lot of popularity with that BlockFi product, which is basically rehypothecation as a service. And I wonder if like I what are your views on do you think that's gonna become more common? Like do like does the coin bases of the world, do all these services, do they try and offer this product because people want that product? You know, this interest bearing uh, savings account in quotations? I think the gold mine that BlockFi hit is that this is a, a great loss leader, a great marketing play and customer acquisition strategy. So, you know, it, it, why would you, you know, the, the thinking is like, why would you buy Bitcoin on it on this exchange when you can buy Bitcoin on this other exchange and, you know, uh, earn interest on that? Um, so I, it's hard to see, in my view, like what the non-financial utilization of borrowing Bitcoin is. Um, I think most people right now that I've seen who are borrowing it are using it as a way to leverage um, uh, or, or, or short, uh, depending on what side you're on. Um, and, I, and I think there's probably some, some use cases for that. But as far as consumers go, it's kind of hard to say. I have to say, it, is, it has been surprising to me how many people are willing to put their Bitcoin at risk for, you know, interest rates that aren't really that big. Um, 
But it is, I mean, it is clearly something people demand. And, you know, it's something we pay close attention to. You know, if we ever offered anything that was lending, it would be something that was completely segregated from a full reserve account. Um, and people would you know, be opting into that risk. Uh, so, you know, that's how we think about it. And that's how we think people should do it um, if, if they do offer it. Yeah. No, I just had to ask that question. Steve Barber was tweeting about it this morning, calling for uh, calling for an exchange insolvency uh, at some point soon. And it's just on the top of my mind. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this that, comes back to infrastructure too. It's like you know, how can we how can we prove we have your coins, right? Um, you know, proof of reserve is a non-trivial thing to do. Um, we have some ideas on kind of how to offer products that make it you know a simple user experience to have some assurances around where their coins are and, and things like that. So, um, you know, this is, these are other things we're thinking through. Yeah. Well, let's talk through them. What, uh, what are you guys working on in the back end? You mentioned that you guys, what can you talk about that you are working on that, uh, from a product offering? I mean, so, you know, one of, so, you know, we don't have any official announcements to make around, um, you know, other than like the Harbor wallet, you know, thing. I mean, that's like step one, right? You know, you have your coins if you have your coins, right? Um, that's that's like the, the top of the stack. And then it's like, okay, if you're trusting us with your coins, what kind of assurances can we give you around, you know, where those are that we have them under our custody? And so, you know, we're thinking along the lines of, you know, how can we do a, a simple proof of reserves kind of thing for our clients who want that? Um, that shows and that shows them their coins probably on chain, right? And sends them some proof that we can spend them. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not a big fan. I gotta say of like the whole like zero knowledge proof, like proof of reserves kind of schemes. I think they're operationally complex and operational complexity uh, significantly hampers security. Um, I also think like zero knowledge proofs are really hard at the end of the day for anyone to like do any sort of like any normal person to verify, it's, it's like moon math, right? And, and so, you know, basically I think like the, the nut to crack is elegant and simple proof of reserves, um, you know, that, that people can very intuitively double check. And, and so we're, we're, we still have a lot of work to do there, but we have all the infrastructure in place, we think to be able to offer something like that down the road. Yeah. What about yeah. multi-sig? Our infrastructure is also ready to do that. Like we, you know, that's that's something else that we're looking at. Um, you know, the the the, the Harbor Wallet product we offer, uh, it would work just the, the same. We it, it would be pretty low lift for us to make it work to just see the coins in a multi-sig wallet as well. And then and then it just comes down to building a UI to facilitate signing the partially signed Bitcoin transactions. Um, you know, kind of the way the way we think about it is, uh, you know, our River.com and the River Mobile app will be able to replace if you just use Bitcoin. You you know the goal is you won't have to use you know uh, any of your other Harbor Wallet you know interfaces, right? Um, you can just use River uh, or Bitcoin Core or Harbor Wallet interface running locally if you don't want to trust us, right? Um, but and so you know the, the way it would work for us is you have a multi-sig wallet you're watching, you have a you have single hub key wallet. Um, you know, you request a partially signed Bitcoin transaction from us to spend somewhere. Uh, we send it to you. You sign it. You broadcast it yourself. You send it to us to broadcast, whatever. Um, and then on top of that, we can do a lot of cool kind of value-added things, right? Like we can we can ping you. We can send you a notification. Hey, fees are low. Here's a consoli UTXO consolidation transaction for your wallet. Sign ah. it, and your coins get consolidated, right? Um, I love that. Yeah. Uh, so we there's like you know. You know, we're thinking like pretty kind of like we're trying to be pretty forward thinking with this and thinking, you know, in, in a world where on-chain fees are going to become higher and higher, where we have lightning and we have this UTXO management, you know, uh, system on our back end, what can we do to enable our clients to help them save money on their transaction fees? Um, and so we have a lot of ideas, you know, frankly, just kind of stirring around and it's a matter of kind of prioritizing and finding what people want most. Multi-sig is one of those, right? Um, multi-sig is, you know, I don't think, I think some people have done a really great job, you know, like Casa has done a really great job. Um, it's one of those things though, it's hard to know, is it ever gonna be a mainstream thing or is it gonna remain a niche product? I think it's, uh, 
it, there's just a lot of user research left to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But as Matt's Matt's uh, got a six months TM. Are we down to uh, five months now? We're at like four and a half, dude. To, you to gotta... self-sovereign multi-sig, at least. I think multi-sig yeah. provides a really good fit for the customer that right now is more comfortable with custody. Because you can do a lot of interesting things as as an organization, River can, where, where you provide the same hand-holding that they like with custody without while minimizing trust there right like there's 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 some there's some schemes there that could be really interesting that i think haven't been explored stuff like where maybe you even control the majority of the keys but the user has you know a minority of the keys so that they know if if a transaction if if their funds are segregated if they move at least they know you're doing you're up to something you know even though they don't have the ability to actually transfer out yeah, there's also the same. There's there's also more creative things to do with single signature wallets or single pub key wallets that I don't think anyone's really put the work into to to, to you know taking it um, taking it all the way. For example, another idea around making self custody just much <coughs> much less intimidating uh, without uh, without having to worry about seeds as much is just this idea of like sweep transactions. Um, a Steve Steve Lee's actually uh, kind of inspired the idea and has, has done a lot of work here with some others uh, thinking through some of this. The idea basically being, let's say you registered a harbor wallet with River, right? Um, every time that you spend from that harbor wallet, uh, we would ask you to sign a sweep transaction, sending uh, Bitcoin from your harbor wallet to River, right? Or to an address of your choice, but likely to your custodial account at River. And then you could choose whether we store that or whether you store that in your email or something. Right. And so then, uh, you know, worst case, you lose your ledger, you use your seed, but then you can broadcast this sweep transaction and then we can um, child pays for parent it. Right. If the fee is too low, we can like bump it for you. Right. Or something. Um, and uh, you, you'd always have this like backup sweep that could send to river, you know, like there are ideas like that that are also, you know, things worth exploring. There's a lot of work left to do, but um, there, there, there's a lot of possibilities here. I've never thought of that. That's really interesting. Yeah so what's it been like scaling up your team throughout all this growth what uh I, you guys brought on a good friend of of matt and i's rod rudy uh yeah rod's he's, awesome we love rod on the pod yeah uh yeah no i mean it, it's been, it's been really fun i mean there's you know i can speak to all the engineering stuff but i think the you know the real hard work has also been on the back end when you go to river.com it's really the tip of the iceberg um and not just tech behind the scenes, but all the operations behind the scenes, moving all the money around. Uh, there, there's so much going on that I think a lot of people don't really understand at a company just to make it, just to make it a simple experience to log in, connect the bank account, click buy Bitcoin is an incredible amount of operational work. And um, so I, I think Andrew can talk to kind of the back end like ops behind that. Yeah. So behind the scenes, there's an incredible amount of stuff that happens um, when you link your bank account and uh, you know click buy Bitcoin on River.com. It seems very simple, but it's 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 not. You know, all this stuff in the back end with the the accounting is quite complex, um, as well as our risk management, making sure that, that liquidity is where it needs to be when it needs to be there. Um, essentially, we're fronting liquidity for our users, so we're we're using our own capital um, and we're trading from our own position. So managing that and, and optimizing and rebalancing in a very efficient manner is really 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 important. Um, and it's complex because of Bitcoin's volatility. Uh, and as well as the limitations of the U.S. banking system, which, you know, for some reason uh, is, is like a 9 to 4 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday system, whereas Bitcoin is 24-7. So how do we uh, thinking about how we always, you know, manage that settlement mismatch um, is, is always a challenge. And we operate 24-7. And we operate 24-7 as well. So right. if we let people buy Bitcoin 24-7, how do we how do we service that that, that demand on a on, on, a, on banks that only operate, you know, five days a week, nine to five or nine to four, right? Um, so you, it's not do you have to err on the side of caution on the weekends and try to overcapitalize as much as possible, or we we do, and and so a lot of that is is you know partnering with OTC desks, exchanges, other liquidity providers, um, making sure that we can you know have everything in place in the capacity when we need it because you know I, I what what we see in general, and I think I think every exchange and brokerage product sees the same, but 
you know, 95% of your revenue comes from, you know, a half a percent or 1% of the days. Um, and, and so what, what you have to have is you have to kind of always be prepared for those extreme cases, because that's really when the, the that's really when the business, um, has to be firing on all four cylinders. So, uh, it's kind of over preparing, um, you know, for those crazy conditions, everything kind of hits at once, right? Our liquidity will get constrained. Client services will be utilized at 100%. Um, and you know, just making sure that all the infrastructure and stuff is 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 online and functioning as expected. Um, you know, that stuff is not that's not trivial. Especially since Bitcoin is known to pump on the weekends. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you you know, you're operating for, for like Andrew said, you know, 95% of the time in these you know calm seas, uh, glassy smooth often some days. And everything's just you know running like a well-oiled machine, but you, like you have to be, be spending those times preparing for that day. You know, every three months or so, we're just going to get slapped across the face with having you know all, all, your banking's going to be constrained, your customer service is going to be constrained, your engineering's going to be constrained. Everything's just going to be like you know has has to be ready to just elastically scale. You know, like a hundred x on you know on on a moment's notice. And that's really the challenge of running a business like this. And you've got to be under a game on those days because that's when you really make the impression on the clients. Um, you know, people always are complaining about cash app, shutting off trading or Coinbase, you know, going, going offline during those periods. And it just, uh, you know, it may, makes people frustrated. Fortunately, we, we've never had that. We've never had to go offline during one of those periods, but um, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of preparation to kind of prepare for that. If I'm not mistaken, you guys, for your, you have an auto stack feature and you provide an incentive to users because it's discounted, um, which I don't think I know of any other service that offers a discount to do the, the auto stack. Do you find that, that users are, are, are liking that feature? Like, I feel like that reduces that risk that you were talking about, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and it's a great way to kind of smooth things out a little bit. What we see is we see a lot of our users signing up and buying small amounts regularly, um, and then when the, the the dip happens, that's when they're lump summing in very 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 large amounts. But people kind of like to spread out their exposure, um, you know, just in general to kind of always you know be acquiring uh, Bitcoin, um, and then when there's real price action, that's when those folks lump in the big amounts. Um, and I think Alex actually tweeted a chart about it last week uh, with just the number, the uh, number of recurring orders we found on the platform is just going parabolic right now because um, I think a lot of people are preparing for the bull run. Yeah, I remember that yeah. chart. Was, yeah. uh, see. was March 12th a big test for you guys? Oh, that was – March 12th <laughs> was insane. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were at the office very late that night. Yeah. I think yeah, we left at like midnight or yeah. 1 a.m. Uh, but that's what? Yeah, March Coast time too, right? We were getting ready to head out for the day and then – you know, we're like, oh, well, things are picking up. The price is getting interesting here. Um, and, and, you know, next thing we know, like, we're just seeing so much volume. It, it just did not stop um, until pretty late in the night. Yeah. But uh, that was that was an interesting night. A lot of fun, though. Yeah, it was an interesting wake business. up, too. It is a fun business to run, I do have to say. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine. Uh, it's a fun space to be in. It's, uh, yeah. You, and, you guys... And, and, the best part is talking to talking to clients, right? You know, just like hearing their stories. Why are you buying Bitcoin? You know, for the first time. Um, and there's just so many interesting people uh, across the board. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just it's a really good place to be. What's uh, one of the more interesting stories you can share with us here? So, I mean, we see we we see everything. Um, you know, from the you know very successful business person who's you know, friends have been telling them about Bitcoin for years and they're, you know what, like, the, I, you know, they, they literally like, I, I have phone calls with these people and they're like, you know, the government's printing all this money and, um, you know, you know, this is a logical conclusion I've come to, like, I need exposure to this and, uh, you know, help me make it happen. And, uh, you know, then what's, what's really cool though, is that, you know, people are smart, right? You know, they're thinking, okay, well, you know, now, what happens if, um, you know, what happens if something happens to River? You know, what, what happens to my Bitcoin? And then I talk to them about self-custody, and they're like, oh, that's an option? Oh, you mean, like, I could control it myself? And, and, and you see their brain, like, going there, and they're like, so you, like you, you, 
you see them kind of coming to the conclusions that we've all come to, right? And then the, you know, we can just, we feel really good knowing like we're helping them start the journey, right? And, um, and, and yeah, and so, I mean, an, an interesting anecdote here is actually, it kind of ties back to Andrew and I's backstory. Our great grandfather, um, he had his gold confiscated by the government uh, under Executive Order 6102, which we have a poster of it in the office. And um, we have clients who ask us, and they go, I know about Executive Order 6102. Uh, you know, what happens if the government you know, comes from my Bitcoin? And so we get people like that. And then, and then we have all sorts of uh, very interest, other interesting people. Um, you know, I don't know if you have any stories you want to share. Well, I, you know, I think what's interesting is we have a lot of clients who, you know, they're, they're pretty wealthy and they make their first Bitcoin purchase with us. And they, they will call in to place the orders over the phone sometimes. Sometimes we'll do it on the web app, but they like to have that high touch relationship with us. And we love that. Um, and so they, you know, talking to them, they seeing their journey into Bitcoin, I think has been really, really interesting because some of these folks, they don't have any Bitcoin. And then three months later, they're all in, right? <laughs> and I mean, these are people who are incredibly wealthy, put like half their net worth into Bitcoin. Oh, shit. Um, and so, you know, th that's been really, really exciting to see. Uh, because a lot of these folks have been successful in their careers doing a lot of things in the financial services and they, they kind of see how the sausage is made and they realize the whole financial system is a house of cards and uh, the, the Bitcoin is kind of the way out. Um, and it's reckless and they come to the conclusion it's reckless not to hold Bitcoin. Um, and so we, we I, I, you know, I see that, you know, moderately regularly in some of our clients. That's uh. That's the conclusion I came to from finance was looking at it. I mean, this doesn't seem like it's going to work out. But going back to sort of the process your users go through when they have that aha moment, like, ah, I can take custody of this. Like, are you noticing any trends of people going from zero to taking their UTXOs into their own possession? So typically, this is, this is the typical breakdown. We, we either have the clients who come in as power users, have a cold storage already set up, and are switching over to River from a Coinbase or something like that, and um, they, they're ready to go. We have the brand new people who I would say break into two buckets. Either they have a friend helping them, and those people sometimes self-custody because their friends uh, helping them self-custody and explaining everything to them. And then we have the people who don't have really any friends hand-holding them. We're, we're the, their kind of first touch point, and they are – almost exclusively custodying with us, but interested in self-custodying and ask us a lot of questions. And so, you know, we're not, we haven't, you know, our, our company, we launched, you know, pretty much went public earlier this year. So our clients are still, you know, typically less than, have less than a year of history with us. And they have a lot of learning to do. And so with these clients, what we do is we say, you know, if you want to self-custody, you know, withdraw a little bit of Bitcoin first, play around with it get comfortable, you know, come to us with questions. Um, here, here's like, here's, here's a ledger, here's a treasure, here, you know, here are your different options for hardware wallets. And Backing up a seed. Exactly. And so, you know, we want to say like, make the mistakes with a little bit of money uh, and then, you know, ask us questions along the way and we're here for you. And that's kind of like, that's kind of where it is, right? It's, and then they go at their own pace. Um, the last thing you want to do is force someone to custody a bunch of money, but they're not ready to custody. Um, because they're going to end up in a really bad spot. So we really just see our job as holding their hand and, and answering their questions at whatever pace they want to go. Yeah, that's You're the Uncle Jim. That's what Marty did with Portnoy, and he lost his seed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and now he's got, and then he traded Link and all those shit coins for one week, and now he's in, on his deathbed with coronavirus. So yeah. <laughs> You hate to see that's, it. Hate to see it. That's why you don't you don't mess with the identical twins. You mess with the cousins. They'll get you into some bad stuff. You know. <laughs> exactly. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have no ill will towards the Winklevi. Um, uh, but uh, no, it is funny. We were talking about the the family dynamics of running a business. You either want to be identical twins or cousins. You don't want to be uh, brothers that that aren't identical twins. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't I don't have any experience running a business with siblings, but you know, I would imagine it'd be. It could be, there's a lot more challenges when it's an immediate family member. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is something I had to br bring up while we have Matt here because we talked about it uh, during our first conversation, Alex. But Matt, what do you think of the river.com domain name? Is that a quality domain? Super quality. 
I don't know. I don't know how you guys got that. Nine ninety nine on GoDaddy. Is there is there a no, story no. behind it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, well, it was so it was the result of you know we we decided to rebrand, um, and you want to tell the story, Andrew? Uh, you, you can tell it. You can tell it. Oh, you, you got it. So we were we were deciding that we needed to rebrand. If you didn't know, our previous domain was Alto Financial. So right. Um, you know, just on the merit of absolutely of that domain horrible name. domain name. Horrible domain. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, it's a great domain. You know, before you raise any funds, but you know, after that, it's not a great one for a consumer product. So, um, kind of looking at different things there, we uh, we looked around. We talked to some some experts in the space, some big domain brokers, um, and eventually saw that that River.com was going for what we thought was a pretty pretty good price, um, and uh, decided, you know, hey, let's uh, rebrand River Financial. There's a lot of symbolism with it as well. Um, you know. We, we kind of take the long-term approach and river is kind of something that's carved out over thousands of years, tens of thousands, millions of years. Um, and you know, there, there's just a lot of symbolism with that as well. It's a the, uh, previous owner, um, had, had owned it since like the early nineties. Uh, and you know, was just sitting on it pretty much. Smart dude. And, uh, was ready to, I guess, ready to cash it in. Ready to part ways with it. It's, it's great. Yeah. It's ironic because it's such a good domain name that I do find myself going to riverfinancial.com sometimes by accident because I just assume you can't have river.com. Yeah. 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 It's, um, I don't know. We're pretty happy with it. Like, yeah. It I worked think, out. It really worked it out. It was a good trade. Yeah. I, I think we, yeah. Yeah. It's a strong brand move. It's a good asset on the balance sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is so kind we, of funny. I have the info at river.com email that goes to Alex and I, and we just get a lot of random, random stuff that goes to it, like people's hotel reservations and like lunch orders. And yeah, a lot of people just like send stuff to that, which is always kind of fun. Really? That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So what are you guys excited about moving forward? Not only for River, but for Bitcoin. Uh, Alex, I saw you retweet something from the Bitcoin Optech newsletter this week about DLCs. Um, yeah, and, and derivative P two P derivatives. There, um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's been you know going on behind the scenes. I mean, in my experience, the the, the most exciting thing happening or that's been happening over the last few years has been the least sexy. Um, but it's going. It's it you know it's about this long term building this long term foundation to bring Bitcoin to the world. And 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 what the major trend here, I think that a lot of people haven't seen is the the standards uh, convergence around standards. And the development around standards that will enable software, um, enable very fast acceleration of the pace of Bitcoin software development um, for consumers. So specifically, uh, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, right? The the PSBT spec um, that is a standard format for storing uh, and communicating, um, you know, unsigned or partially signed Bitcoin transactions uh, is a game changer, right? This allows us. Uh, in our own infrastructure to pass around a Bitcoin transaction to different signers and I'll generate a Bitcoin transaction that anyone's wallet can sign. Um, and, you know, basically, like, it, it, you know, if you look at the the internet today, right, everything is off. Um, everything has this, these, like, communication uh, protocols that they follow. It allows all the software to talk to each other, right? Um, until, like, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, Bitcoin software couldn't talk to each other in a, in a format uh, in a shared format, right? It couldn't pass around the core of, of, of Bitcoin software, which is the transaction. Um, and so, you know, going to, to, to Matt's, you know, point about multi-sig. So now once, once all these hardware wallets and all these so software wallets implement, um, PSBT compatibility, every, um, every, every wallet can participate in a multi-sig, right? Um, and custodial institutions. So you could have this world where you could have your multi-sig where one, one signer is river, one signer is your Electrum wallet, one signer is your ledger, and you know, maybe one signer is another institution. And it'd be relatively straightforward for you know, all of these things to be compatible. So that's one thing that I find really cool. Um, and then uh, there's just like uh, these other like little standards around like wallet descriptors, right? Like how do you describe the, what defines a Bitcoin wallet and the rules that wallet follows? Is it multi-sig? Is it a single pub key? You know, what kind of addresses is it generating? Just like the standards around that to allow 
third-party services like ours to you know import your watch-only wallet and watch your coins for you, um, or, or your you know self-hosted you know software tools that allow you to you know have your own multi-sig with different hardware wallets and then throw that wallet descriptor into a you know third-party multi-sig watch-only tool that you host yourself, right? And, and so all these things just talk to each other now, and, and we're starting to see you know things come from this. So I think that's really cool. It's kind of boring because it's like these little minutia, you know, behind the scenes, but um, it's going to enable, I think, really great consumer products. I mean, it's necessary though, right? If this is ever going to be scalable and successful and practical at the end of the day. Exactly. You need standards, you need protocols. Um, and that's something that Bitcoin focuses on that no one else really does. Yeah. I mean... We don't need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was, I was gonna bring up the ETH two point oh test net that failed because of their dependency on NTP time last weekend, but I'll, I'll forego that. I mean, that's an example of the totally different mindset, right? Where it's like, let's completely break any sort of backwards compatibility <laughs> for the sake of you know, quote unquote progress, progress, right? And completely break everything and make incompatible and kind of uh, obsolete everything we've built over the past five to 10 years because we had a new and quote unquote better idea. And I think like the fundamental difference in mindset between that and a Bitcoin is like this, like the, the value of like just incremental progress and hardening is ju it's just like exponentially greater and greater and greater over time. And you know, at, for the first few years, it feels like you're kind of treading water or you're on a treadmill, not really, um, not really moving. Right. But then you see like, the ecosystem start to like uh, just flourish because now, because it hits this inflection point where everything is standard and mature enough to build like people are willing to spend their time and resources building stuff on top of it now, right? And um, you have to put in that work. Uh, so anyways. I mean, yeah, you can, you can apply that to the business you two are building as well. And so do you, uh, we talked about this during our first episode, Alex, why you guys are Bitcoin only and, and the advantages it will afford you. But do you see them, the Bitcoin only advantages paying off in the in the short to medium term in the next two to three oh, years? Yeah. It's already paying off. Yeah, I think a lot of people yeah. come to us because we're Bitcoin only. Um, and, you know, as a result, of just being able to offer some of the best tech in the space, in the U.S. at least, for, for Bitcoin, I think is has gotten us a lot of clients. Um, and I think that trend's gonna continue over time. It, it's rule number one of business too. Like when you're starting a company, do one thing and do it well, right? Um, we let people buy, sell, and manage their Bitcoin, right? And we do it better than everyone else because we just focus on Bitcoin. And if you look at the demand in the market and you look at the money flowing in, you know, 95% of these people, they just wanna buy Bitcoin, right? They're not trying to trade, you know, uh, Dogecoin Day, like day trade dogecoin right you know what i mean like so why not just do the one thing that you know 90 to 95 percent of people want better than everyone else and not compromise to support this that like five percent long tail that you know frankly is probably not going to be around in 10 years um and i think i think that's paying off for us i also think it attracts the right type of customer as well i mean the, the types of clients that we get are very long-term focused um they're not you know short-term focused they're not traders they're not gamblers um, they're really in this for the long run, which is kind of our mindset as well. You're not going to be listing Digibyte anytime soon? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, that brings brings up a topic that I wanted to discuss, uh, Lightning. Uh, what, like, what pain points have you seen there with your Lightning integration? Yeah, so I mean, Lightning has come a very long way in the past two years. Uh, even even when, when starting the, the company, um, you know, we used to see a lot of pain and failures, and now we see a lot fewer. Um, that said, it, there is still a lot left to do. I think one of the biggest pain points is around the the, the infrastructure, the backend infrastructure, right? It, the Lightning is a completely separate system uh, from our own wallet right now, and you know, not to you know say PSBT too much, but like with the partially signed Bitcoin transactions, right now, now we, we have, we, like down the road, we can have a single signer that signs our lightning channel transactions 
and our normal Bitcoin transactions, right? And it passes the partially signed the the signed transaction to L and D, right? To 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 manage after it's signed it. So our inf these standards will allow our infrastructure to like talk um, talk to each other a little better and, and integrate a little easier. So yeah, so one of the pain points has just been the completely segregated nature of the Lightning node versus our the rest of our Bitcoin infra, um, and just channel management. Um, Loop has helped a lot here. Um, and I think the biggest one though is just the UX. Um, you know, we have we that's a lot of that's on us, but part of it's just the nature of Lightning. You know, until recently, you had this whole invoice-based model where you had to the user had to type in an amount, um, generate an invoice they wanted to be paid with, copy this ugly looking string or QR code and send it to someone to pay. Um, and you know, it's it's just not like that nice. I mean, it, it, it's great because it's instant once that's done, but um, it could be a lot better. And key send is really, I think, the next iteration of like where, where Lightning is going to go in terms of the, the UX. Um, we really want to implement that on our end, uh, where instead of having to generate invoices, you just have a single QR code. And embedded in that QR code is your user ID on River. And so anyone who could then pay you know, that um, QR code over Lightning, and the funds would be attributable to that user on River. Um, so it would be, become non-interactive, basically, which would, I think that's the next iteration. I think yeah. the interactivity is an unfamiliar friction for most users who are the first time Lightning users. Yeah. yeah they're, they're... I was going to say, I saw Stefan Levera tweet out yesterday that like, multi-part payments have, have really helped with the, uh, the ability for transactions to go through pretty flawlessly. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but in liquidity, I think is always going to be a, a, a tough constraint, right? Um, and there's just a lot of, there's a lot of thinking left to do in the space around how to, as an exchange, how to reason about security, uh, availability of funds, and how Lightning plays into that. For example, um, you know, are we ever going to support somebody withdrawing, uh, you know, 100 Bitcoin on Lightning, right? Um, like it's a very scary thing to for us to think about having a, a lightning channel open with that much with that much bitcoin in it right um because even though it seems secure the there are, like there the statefulness and like the state machine of a lightning transaction and a lightning channel is just so much more complex than a bitcoin transaction and so um you know reasoning about the security of that uh there's just a lot less history a lot less data a lot less you know kind of institutional knowledge around how to really lock down that much money in Lightning. And so, you know, scaling up the, the, the maximum amount of money that can be sent over Lightning, I think is going to be a significant challenge uh, for institutions. We just have to put in the work. And at its core, it's a hot wallet. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's the other challenge. It's a hot wallet, right? So, um, you know, and there the protocol itself is interactive. And so, you know, yeah, right. It's like, it, it's kind of unclear you know, where that pain point is going to be. Um, right now, the biggest limiter has been just channel capacity, and not not because of security, but just because of like the hard kind of limit on the Lightning network. But the next the next step, once that Wumbo, um, once ch Wumbo channels, uh, sorry, the Wumbo bit is split, uh, is going to be like how much money are people actually willing to put hot, right? Yeah. Um, that's yeah, like. I think that's when we'll start to see the the pain points and the attack vectors probably more more aggressively, right? Yeah, and then maybe maybe the answer is um, economic incentives, right? Maybe maybe the answer is that some institutions decide. Um, you know, we haven't made any decisions here, but you know, maybe some institutions decide that they'll, uh, you know, users will choose to allocate funds to put on the Lightning node and will be compensated with you know routing rewards, but they are also assuming the risk. Of that, they're trusting exchange to run that Lightning wallet, you know, with, you know, with proper security. Um, but they get a reward, but there's also potential risk, right? You know, just just an idea, but like maybe that's what happens. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting idea. It's a very interesting idea. Sort of spread out the risk among among the users, skin in the game with the product yeah. that you're buying. Yeah, no, they get paid for it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, all right. This has been a fun hour. What, uh, you got another question, Matt? Yeah. Um, I didn't know where to fit it in. 
Uh, so apologies for the loaded question at the end of our conversation. Uh, last time I was speaking to you both was in San Francisco. Um, Pre-COVID, it was like January-ish, I think. And we were talking about chain surveillance. And we were talking about how you guys weren't subscribed to any of these services, the chain analysis, uh, elliptic, any of the, the big names. Is that still the case today? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's still true. We, we, we don't have any surveillance technology in place. Um, you know, I've looked at a lot of the, the folks in the space and, you know, the, the, the predominant knowledge right now is that it is a necessity. And I think in the city of New York, it probably is, but we don't operate in the city of New York yet. We don't have a bit license. So, you know, we've been able to get a lot of MPLs without it. Regulators haven't really asked us about it. Um, I don't know if that's going to be true forever, um, but it's certainly our objective to keep pushing back on that. Um, to the extent possible, um, you know, basically our, my thinking on it is, is this like, we, you know, a lot of it's pseudoscience, it's probabilistic. Um, it has adverse effects. I think you can end up blacklisting some good transactions, um, especially, you know, if things are coming from another exchange or something like that, you know, there might be some tainted coins there, but are we really going to penalize our user, uh, if, if they didn't have any knowledge of that? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I've looked into this a bit, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not really convinced about the uh, effectiveness of it. Um, philosophical stuff aside, I just don't think practically it, it really does what it says it does. Yeah, I, I mean, hear that. for us, you know, from a from a federal level, like you know, we have a mandate to follow OFAC rules, right? There are Bitcoin addresses on the OFAC list. Um, you know, we block those, right? Um, you know, and, and so, you know, aside from that, you know, as Andrew said, it's, you know, I've spent a lot of time, you know, delving into the world of blockchain and analytics from the technical perspective. I've developed course assignments, you know, in grad school for students to learn how to analyze the blockchain and cluster. And, you know, it's so easy to break, you know, these heuristics. And um, so, yeah, it, you know, the usefulness is very questionable. And I think that down the road, I mean, there is a, um, I think there's an opportunity here for an open source project for someone in the Bitcoin community to build. Um, and that is like an open source uh, analy like chain analytics tool that companies could run self-hosted, right? Um, it, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an idea I've had. It's like, you know, it's, it's not a cure-all, but it's a potential, like, like kind of like how Bit, uh, BTC Pay server uh, killed... Uh, Killed, well, you know, was attempting to tell, kill BitGo, right? BitPay. Bit sorry, BitPay, sorry, not, not BitGo, BitPay, right? You know, how do we build, you know, who can build the self-hosted version that can help companies get off of these information sharing networks, right? Um, where they don't have to actually share the inf information, they can just keep it in-house. Um, because really, at the end of the day, you know, our biggest priority is our clients and their privacy. And, um, you know, we have a government mandate to also protect the privacy of our clients. And we need to make sure that, that you know, not just ethically as well. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you know, it, that's very important to us. And on top of that, I've talked to every company who offers a product like this, um, like a, you know, a chain monitoring product. Um, and I, I'm not going to mention specifics uh, about specific companies here, but I've seen a lot of companies take different approaches. The, the ones that I think are more egregious are the ones where you actually have to send a lot of data to them and they come back with the report. But some are purely um, pool only, meaning you're basically just pooling information about a specific address from them. So you're not really sending them information other than this address. And I think, you know, ways around that would be, you know, sending them a lot of random addresses of which a subset are actually your users. Um, so that way you're not really disclosing anything too material. Um, and, and I think that that is one way that, that like companies can pr preserve privacy um, and meet mandates if they have a mandate for this. But uh, e even then, again, like the, the, the underpinning issue here is that it's just not effective. It's pseudoscience. Yeah, it's overbearing too, right? Because you guys would have to pay for that and 
and deal with yeah. the report. Yeah, these things aren't cheap either. Yeah. Yeah, I really, uh, really like that idea of a bit BTC pay server for these chain analysis tools that can be open source and and leveraged. A project idea for you freaks out there who are, who are looking for something to do. And at the end of the day, you don't want terrorists using you know your your platform to launder money, right? So like, there is a level of of uh, due diligence that you know you you just need to do. Um, not just to be compliant with the law, but also to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think an open source thing could could help band together, you know, like-minded folks who do care about privacy and really just keep the bad people from from using. And are, you true, are you a true anarcho-capitalist if you don't want the terrorists <laughs> using your platform? <laughs> uh, would you, I mean, would you guys ever think about doing something like Bull Bitcoin does with automatically coin joining deposits or anything like that, or? That... Well, batch withdrawals. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, withdrawals. you know, batching withdrawals is, is one thing. I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, really we have to think long term and ask ourselves, like, what's what does the end state for Bitcoin look like? And I think, you know, in the near future, we're, you know, we're seeing fees go up on chain, um, partnering with companies uh, that, that we trust to batch, tr to, to batch transactions together um, to save space, right? Uh, it is interesting um, offering, you know, our, our clients the ability to, you know, batch with us as well, uh, you know, from their own wallets and things like that, or, or outsiders. I mean, we have to think about these things, but um, and, and lightning also yeah. helps as well. Yeah. I, so, I, yeah. I've never thought of two companies batching together. That's pretty, pretty sweet. I mean, you know, I think from our perspective, the input. Uh, Clustering heuristic is already broken, right? With coin join, so like, why not just talk about like batch, like space optimization, right? And lowering transaction fees on chain for your clients, and also protecting their privacy, right? Um, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's really I think the, the discussion needs to be on to protecting user privacy, and uh, and and saving saving them money on on block on uh, transaction fees. This is like the creative shit that nobody really thinks of. Well, we are. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know you are, but everybody's like, "Oh, fees, fees, fees. companies batching together." It's something I never thought of. That's yeah. pretty cool. Like, I mean, so if you if you if you look at a, a transaction graph, you look at a clustered graph using kind of these various heuristics, like uh, the the like you know this is some you you make assumptions about how Bitcoin transactions work, and then cluster all transactions going back all all the way to the beginning of the blockchain, and you see you see all these big clusters form, and one of them is Gox, right? And that already broke, broke the clustering heuristic because you could used to be able to import private keys um, into Gox and also into Coinbase, right? So just by nature of that, like the clusters from back then, like Gox is just massive cluster, right? And it's, it just consumes like like half the graph, right? And you know it just has all these coins in it. Um, so so yeah, you know it's it, yeah. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but kind of interesting. Yeah, I like what you're saying. Uh... You know, and I mean, if something like Schnorr and Taproot eventually gets uh, merged into Core, that could certainly help with this as well. Yeah, and makes all the outputs look the same. That'd be nice. Because so our multi-sig, you know, cold storage can look if we if we use if we can, you know, use um. There's still ways to go. I think before the multi-sig stuff that we need for Schnorr will be will be there. But um, you know, then our multi-sig storage can look exactly like you know a single single pub key wallet right um, yeah how long do you think we're going to wait for snore and taproot <laughs> and uh i'm going to put the the onus on you alex to put forth an activation path yeah well see i don't know that i don't know timelines there but i do know that we're going to be ready as a company we've already started thinking about the engineering we need to do to support taproot addresses snore addresses for timeline and network rollout you know the, the lesson i've learned is don't 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 ask first like i don't like I don't ask, yeah. right? It's like it's one of those things where the code's there. Let's just see like who decides to kind of run with it. Um, I don't know. Um, two years, I have no idea. Well, but well, we're thinking about the kinds of things we can do with it already. Uh, we're thinking about the code upgrades. I think I'm hoping we're we're going to be able to support it day one whenever it does roll out. Maybe you guys should be the ones just championing the rollout. You know, you guys want to use it. So we could actually theoretically already allow. Like it, you can already send to um, 
these outputs, right? You just can't spend from them yet. So, you know, we could just allow people to send it, send it in there. I, I think maybe, I think there is like something where you could allow people to send uh, to it to incentivize upgrading or something. I, I don't know. Maybe there's an interesting game to play there. Just don't, don't come up with some closed door agreement about the activation. Oh, believe me. Definitely uh, not. No, no, uh, no. I, will, I, will, I promise I will not be making any medium posts calling the core devs bad <laughs> actors. You don't, you don't plan on meeting in a hotel room in New York anytime soon. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. <laughs> meeting. If you're having a meeting in hotel rooms, right? Like I think we've learned over the past few years. You know, that's what the DA in Florida did, in, like the Epstein case. Like, like it's just a bad look. Like if you're taking a meeting in a hotel room, like you probably don't want to be involved. Yeah. I yeah. No, I agree there. It's, uh, <laughs> you live and you learn these yeah. agreements, uh, never, never really turn out well, especially in, in Bitcoin. Uh, what else is going on? Are you guys excited for the election? Oh, that would be interesting. Uh, it might be a busy night for us. Who knows? We'll right? see. Yeah. We'll see. Oh. You know, I think our, our client base tends to be, you know, like Bitcoin. They're they're on the it's, it's the full spectrum, really. Um, and I think a lot of folks, you know, a lot of our clients also tend to kind of be like, uh, I don't say like above it, but it's kind of like, I think a lot of people in Bitcoin are kind of thinking on a little bit of a different plane than kind of like the day to day politics of things. But um, it will be interesting to see how how it unfolds. Yeah, that was a troll question, uh, <laughs> and no, but. And I've been thinking on this lately and thinking back to our first conversation where we got pretty philosophical, especially around the founding of America, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Uh, this is something I wrote about last week after watching a lecture by Judge uh, Andrew. What the hell is his last name? Matt Napolitano. I can never. Uh, I was told I pronounced it wrong last episode. Napolitano uh, is what I said. Yeah, Napolitano or yeah, whatever Napol it is. Excuse me? Judge Napolitano? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he gave a lecture at the Mises Institute. Well, it was actually at Auburn University on behalf of the Mises Institute earlier this summer. Uh, basically a first lecture in a seven-course, uh, seven-lecture course about the law as it pertains to the Amer America. And the first lecture was about natural law theory. And just, like, listening to that, getting into, like, a... Uh, uh, Aristotle, Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas, and how natural law theory flows from there, really drove home the fact that, that Bitcoin is probably like the biggest achievement in terms of preserving natural laws since the Constitution. I think that's probably pretty on point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, that's one of the cool things about running a company like this is it's more than just a day to day, you know making money thing it's really it's a lifestyle it's a lifestyle right we're part of a, it's a belief system a, a movement um and very few people are lucky enough to get up every day and work on something that they deeply believe in and yeah you know, it's 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 a blessing really yeah i may or may not have called the constitution a shit coin last rh <laughs> the bill of rights <laughs> it's the bill of rights i believe shit coin. no it was, it was the duck you called the declaration a shit coin <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alex, I know you got to run to a dentist appointment here soon. Uh, do you two gentlemen have any final thoughts, any parting notes, any, anything else that you want to get off your chest before we wrap up here? Um, I mean, thanks so much for having us on the show. I think, you know, that we're still in the early innings of this game. Um, you know, as a company, we have a lot to build as an industry. We have a lot to build. Um, I, you know, I think like, the thing that I always try to remind myself every day is just like stay focused and ship. Um, and you, you know, like the Bitcoin ethos is like, you know, conservative incremental improvements lead to, you know, civilization changing things. And I think, you know, we're just focused on staying focused and getting it right. And um, I hope that's what the, you know, everyone working on Bitcoin, uh, you know, I hope that's how everyone's thinking. Andrew. Yeah, I, I think the, the slow and steady path is the way to go, um, not just, you know, from the from the perspective of a financial institution, but also, you know, really what we're building is it's on a multi-decade horizon. 
right? It's not on a month to month, day to day thing. Uh, this is all incremental progress toward a long term vision, long term goal. Um, and you know, I, I think that we need to celebrate the the folks who are who are kind of in the trenches on the day to day, making the long term happen. And thank you, Cordes. Exactly. Always, thank you, Cordes. <laughs> yes, thank you. They uh, they go underscored every once in a while. Thank you to the core devs. Um, no, I mean, if if the progress you've made between the first episode we recorded, which was number 125, uh, to today, this episode, I believe, will be 187. Wow. Uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see uh, the progress you made when we next record. Hopefully, it's in person. For sure. Hopefully, it's in person. Have some whiskey, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring the drinks next time. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do it right. Uh, Andrew, it was a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. Uh, long time coming. Alex, it's always a pleasure. Matt, you got anything to wrap up with here? Thank you, guys. Cheers. Yeah. Keep crushing it. Cheers. See you guys. Peace and, peace and love, freaks. Take care. <laughs>